Don Nelson Burden, welcome to another Indigenous Circle special. The Capel Valley is one of the most spectacular sites in southern Saskatchewan. The hills, the lakes and the trees contrast deeply to the surrounding prairie landscape. The valley's vibrant colours are often a setting for photographers and artists. I'm at the Mackenzie Art Gallery in Regina where a unique show is taking place. One that looks at not only the scenery of the valley but also the history. Tonight, we'll look at this traveling exhibit and take you to the heart of the valley. We'll also meet several people who, for them, the valley is more than just a beautiful place. Tales of Two Valleys When Indigenous Soko Returns. Sharon Chakous is an education coordinator in Saskatoon and has lived here for 17 years. She's taking an afternoon off work to visit an exhibit at the city's Mendel Art Gallery. For her, the occasion is like taking a walk back through time. Well, I enjoy looking at old pictures or, you know, just history. It's really, I find it very intriguing and kind of makes your imagination go to work. You see, Sharon is a Plains Cree from the Pasqua First Nation in the Capel Valley, the valley around which the art exhibit is built. She left home many years ago. Still, wherever she goes, the valley is still with her. I really enjoy and I love the valley. It's home. It's always been there, even though I've been in Saskatoon for quite a number of years. It's home. For all of us, it's about not, not just the place, but our personal relationship to that place. That place, the Capel Valley, always takes you by surprise, regardless of where you're coming from or where you're headed. There comes a moment when the splendor of the valley grabs you, and on a calm autumn day like this, it won't let go. It's like looking at a painting. It's hard to tell what's real. If it's true that art imitates life, then it is even more so that life imitates art in the brushstrokes that are Capel, Tales of Two Valleys. What happens in this exhibition is kind of a cross-section of Saskatchewan or Canadian art even, you know, from, from this early settlement period in the, in the 1800s to, to today. Dan Ring is the driving force behind the show. Two Valleys includes over 300 historical and contemporary works. Ring characterizes the exhibit as differing views of the same valley. And that's sort of part of the two valleys thing too. So it's a First Nations perspective and a settler's perspective. There's also kind of two valleys even physically, the way that it's set out. I mean, you have Last Mountain Lake, which is kind of separate in a, it's connected, but it's sort of separate from, you know, the fishing lakes and, and, and the Capel River, but it's still part of the Capel Valley system. So there's all these kind of um, allusions to um, points of difference and points of convergence. That point is emphasized over and over in the paintings and sculptures. After a summer in Saskatoon, two valleys moved closer to home for a fall and winter show at Regina's Mackenzie Art Gallery. All media is represented. Sculpture, painting, photography, drawings, um, wall hangings, uh, chalices, silver hammered chalices, functional pottery. It's easy to appreciate the time and energy that goes into these paintings. Artist James Henderson spent years working on art like this. But no matter how long and hard you look at it, nothing beats the real thing. Mike Pinay knows this valley well. He's from the nearby Pipikas' First Nation. The Capel Valley continually reminds him of another time. It is a place filled with stories, memories and emotion. This uh, valley has been always been a part of us as First Nation people, but especially you know, myself. Uh, go back to, to the old people. You know, we used to travel with horses and wagons back then, and you know, we used to come down here uh, in the springtime to get fish, and later on we'd come and camp and we'd pick berries, uh, Saskatoons, juke cherries. Uh, you know, we'd set up tent and you know all those things. And, it was really, really good. I got a lot of good memories. Not every memory is good. Mike, like many First Nations people, is a product of the residential school system. The valley was home to one such school at La Brette, nestled away 50 minutes northeast of Regina. Mike still recalls the day he was uprooted and taken from his home. Well, I'll never forget that day. Uh, a big uh, 
three ton truck pulled into the yard and and uh, you know it was quite dramatic actually you know it was the youngster and and there were four nuns in the back of the truck and a priest and Indian agent and they pulled into the yard and told the old people you know that Mike has to go to school in the Brett eh? and we're here to pick him up so it was very dramatic I guess and uh, you know you could see uh, quite a number of kids in the back of the truck crying and you know yelling and trying to get out and, and then you get thrown in the back of the truck and off you go eh? so it was uh, quite an experience and you know I'll never ever forget that day. Those memories echo through the work on display they are haunting an interesting contradiction of beauty and the beast still the happier days of valley life are also here, and in the blink of an eye, they transport Mike to more joyful times. Every artist, uh, you know, when he does a painting, he has a story. Uh, and today, you know, if, uh, we get caught up in, in, in a fast world. Uh, it's modern technology and everything else, and, and we drive cars, and, you know, sometimes we fail to appreciate, you know, what uh, Mother Nature has in store for us. Uh, you know, like the beautiful trees, or the grass, the flowers, and all those things uh, that are depicted in, the, in a lot of the paintings. You know, and the valley is very, very beautiful. You know, the lake, and you know, you can even see yourself in the water sometimes if you, you know, and the lake is nice and calm, and, and but, uh, you know, we fail to appreciate that. Indigenous Circles Tales of Two Valleys will return after these messages. Don't go away. It takes a discerning eye to appreciate some forms of art. For some, the artist's message is not immediately understood. Take Ed Putra, for example. His art is more complex. It holds a deeper meaning for himself and other First Nations people. Ed Putra is a member of Gordon's First Nation. His works are featured prominently in Tales of Two Valleys. He uses a combination of traditional and modern objects, and there's a story behind each and every piece. Just the work itself and the, 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 the aesthetic of the work is enough to uh, satisfy a person. curiosity, but yet there's all of this other content uh, behind, uh, you know, behind the surface of the work with all of this other information. Ed is not afraid to explore new and uncharted territory in his art. The billboard Amazon Burning was showcased at the Mendel Gallery. It provokes reaction. Barney Least considers it a slap in the face of First Nations people. Unfortunately for a lot of people, they can't grasp that abstractness and what they see right away with their visual contact with the art is is kind of taken aback for example like the amazon art as i said before it's it's not it's not something that you want shown in public but right away he gives away his responsible by saying well you're playing bingo so who's your who's he pointing at and when he uses those pictures of the children sitting on the fields with the priest He's pointing at those people, that they're responsible. Ed welcomes controversy. Amazon burning, he says, reflects how First Nations people tend to put environmental issues on the back burner. Gambling, he counters, becomes a priority. The idea originates in his family's preoccupation with bingo and his friend's interest in the depletion of the Brazilian rainforests. In his case, right, well, even in our own case, uh, with what was happening in the Amazon and the, uh, and the environment, it was a concern, and I suppose I felt that, you know, we were just, you know, ignoring these changes that were happening to in the environment. Why I chose bingo, it, again, it's, you know, my, uh, my relatives, it's, <laughs> come on, you guys, <laughs> there's other things happening. Yeah. The serious message in Edward Putra's work does not preclude the opportunity for humor. So, Ed, what is this? It's a, it's a dog, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the title of it. 
but uh, it's actually a satellite uh, image where it was uh, taken from a satellite image of uh, North America at the turn of the, the, I guess, as we entered the millennium, so it was like January 1st, uh, 2000. I took it off the internet. And what I did was I altered the image and uh, put the Treaty 4 territory up there. And my, the reason being was to, uh, I guess, actualize uh, an, an image or a thought and to give, uh, uh, <coughs> to give it more, uh, I guess, significance just so that people could see, uh, you know, this is what Treaty 4 territory is in relation to uh, you know, the rest of uh, North America. It really stands out, but there is a dog there too, isn't Oh, there, there is, yeah. I, I actually, I think, well, it's this whole coyote thing that I've been playing with, yeah. and just uh, when I first looked at the shape of Treaty 4, I thought, oh, it's a coyote sitting down. <laughs> 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 at least that's what I saw. <laughs> now, the, the piece is called Optional Modification, and uh, the reason I called it that was because of this little pamphlet I picked up at Indian Affairs one day, and it was this change in uh, the Indian Act, and this optional modification was to, uh, was that, uh, that we would, they, bands could increase the fine to uh, $5,000 from $50 for trespassing. And, and so when I read that and thought about Regina Beach, I thought, Wow, uh, you know, a lot of money could be made there <laughs> because even the beach itself is reserved. And yeah, I thought, it's part you know, of the Yeah, right there. yeah, I yeah. Thought, thought this is an interesting possibility. This is a replica of the original Catholic Church in Labret. The church is no longer there. The power cables represent the outline of a large sacred rock. First Nations people believed the rock had special powers, not powerful enough apparently. It was destroyed about the time the church was built. The wires portray the church's powerful reach. Again, it's the extent, right? It's yeah. the extent of uh, a power, the extent of, of, uh, of the church, basically. How far can it reach? Can it be unplugged? Plugged. <laughs> and of course, the chair is uh, an element which I've played around with in other pieces. A point of uh, of uh, of uh, contemplation, or you know, to sit down and consider uh, this. There's uh, there's other uh, <coughs> possible meanings which okay. I'd rather not discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Another Patra work: this replica of the Treaty Four monument in Fort Capelle. The monument was built in 1884 at the time of the treaty signing. Patra's monument is broken, intended to show how treaties between Canada and its First Nations people are in a constant state of change, and some would argue, broken. It's in a process of change, it basically in a process of change. The, the reason the mo this monument was created was so that people wouldn't forget about the treaty. That was the rationale for having this thing made, but yet, uh, but yet, uh, People uh, forgot about the mo monument itself. The, the horns. You know, again, thinking about the treaty and just how it becomes like this one-way uh, uh, movement through uh, this document where you can't really go back and you have to keep moving forward. And so the horns itself almost becomes like uh, uh, you would get snagged if you tried moving back. And so it's like this tunnel that just keeps moving. Edward Putra understands what he's trying to convey, but that isn't always the case for those who come to see his work. It doesn't give an explanation. He asks you to make the assumption. My assumption is like he didn't have time to un unfold the wires and whatnot. And I, and it, if you can't be straight with me, then I, I don't have time to look at that. It's not that clear to Mike Pinay either. He knows there's an important message there, but. Uh, well, that Treaty 4 monument, uh, uh, I'm not sure what's on his mind, uh, but uh, what I see there, just trying to figure out, uh, you know, his art uh, and the Treaty 4 monument, uh, it looks like uh, it had uh, fallen down and come apart. And, uh, you know, I take a look at that and also 
look at, you know, that our treaties, it represents our treaties, eh? And, you know, our treaties are being broken. You know, so that's what I see in that artwork. The church, you know, with all the wires wrapped around it. You know, the church, uh, you know, has hurt a lot of our people. You know, so that's what I see in there. You know, and, and like I said, you know, every artist has his has his story, yeah. But that's what I see in these things. You know, we have to take a look at life when we look at something and what it represents, and we think about it. Indigenous circles, tales of two valleys will return after these messages don't go away. This is Fort Capel. It's as much the economic hub of the Capel Valley today as it was 100 years ago. Growth hasn't always been easy, or without tension between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities. You know, a few years ago we had an awakening, and our leaders, you know, and elders, and you know, uh, today we have that back again. And you know, we're trying hard to work with, uh, you know, with uh, with the people in the area and put things together through education and you know through cultural awareness and everything else and trying to work hard for our people eh? so they'll have a better lifestyle and better way of living and i know we have a lot of work to do and you know we still have a lot of problems but things are looking up the treaty four governance center is an instrument for change it's also a symbol built in 2000 it's where chiefs of Treaty 4, the Capel Valley and surrounding area meet to discuss issues affecting both First Nations and non-First Nations people. You know, they talked about our, our people years ago, Yadrin, you know, and even uh, in Fort Capel, you know, they talk about their, what we call, uh, where they signed treaties. Well, that was actually a gathering place even prior to that. You know, the many tribes, you know, like they had different encampments uh, throughout the valley and or wherever, you know, over the winter, you know, and every spring, uh, I was told, you know, there'd be big gatherings in different areas and Fort Capel was one of them. As settlers began to call the valley home, cultures clashed, helping bridge those differences were artists who found a beauty, a majesty in local Aboriginal leaders. I think there's a whole wall of Indian portraits painted by white painters. The paintings say as much about the white man's view of Indian leaders as the Indians themselves, dignified, solemn, menacing. People go, oh, look at those beautiful paintings and look at the character in those faces. And then I heard some other people say, boy, you know, that, you know that's, that's more about the white man's perception of those people. It's not really about who those people were or what they were going through. And that independence of thought is reflected in Tales of Two Valleys. No two people, artist or visitor, will necessarily share the same view or emotion. I think the Capel Valley is very um, beloved to people in Saskatchewan. Um, it's part of what makes Saskatchewan special. I think there's an identity outside of Saskatchewan because of the Capel Valley. And so this was a way for us to um, explore and look at the history of the valley but in a very special way because it's showing many perspectives it's not just showing a particular kind of viewpoint about the history of the valley Kate Davis says the art like the valley is not one particular viewpoint but many well I heard one guy say last night I'd hate to run into that guy in an alley right you know I'm thinking oh man but uh, you know it, you don't want to not show those paintings because they're part of our art history. But what I think this exhibition gives us an opportunity to do is to kind of deconstruct that art history and talk about all the meanings entailed in looking at that painting. It's not just about a heroic portrait. There's a lot of history behind that. Ed Putra's work relies on subtlety, leaving room for interpretation. The work, nonetheless, draws directly on the First Nations experience. A lot of it is uh, information, right? People need to be informed of, of uh, you know, why things are the way they are. 
And that's why I find so interesting about this show is that it is presenting uh, you know, a lot of historical information. And in my own work, that is one of the issues that I've been you know, very much interested in history. So hopefully it will stimulate a, an awareness in the viewers of the complex history of that place and the importance of, of both groups of people to that, to that area and, um, and how their lives were really totally tied together um, and still are. And that's another reason why I think the art gallery is so important, because you can engage in those kinds of conversations with people and say, I'm not sure I like this, or what does it mean to you? And, and so it engages you more deeply about the exhibition. The story of the Capel Valley is as complex and diverse as the ecosystems that live here, and that diversity is reflected through the people and their stories. Tales of Two Valleys explores the differences leaving the viewer to draw their own interpretations, their own conclusions. And that is true of the people you've met tonight. Edward Putra and Mike Pinay certainly have memories and emotions. Dan Ring has his own. And for the most part, they are not even faintly similar. Still... I still walk around the hills and uh, <coughs> still have a lot of relatives, well, a lot of relatives buried there. And you know, old high school friends who still uh, go back and uh, visit. And, uh, of course, the Treaty 4 Governance Center, watching that, you know, uh, grow and develop. Well, even then, back back then, you know, it was beautiful. And, like, even, you know, uh, through some of the experiences I've had. But we used to, you know, as I went to school, we, they used to take us up in the hills so we can play and stuff like that, you know. and. Uh, run around up in the hills, and we used to go pick chook cherries. Even back then, eat chook cherries, come back with brown teeth, and and uh, then we used to do we used to slide in the winter time up in the hills, and so it was. We also had a lot of fun, right? I think the valley is a special place. It's a place where people, you know, they've come apart, but they've also come together. The Capel Valley has always been a gathering place for First Nations people, a place of peace, rejuvenation, and it remains so today for all people, ensuring that all the tales of the valley are passed on. I'm Nelson Burt. Thanks for watching. Good night.